uh, good stuff today. We're going to start doing research methods. Awesome! Entire semester length courses on research methods. Obviously, I cannot give you an entire semester in two class periods, but we can at least get started. So what we're going to do is we're going to see how social scientists in general, so we're going to have social scientists, not just social psychologists, but how social scientists in general can attempt to discover what variables matter and then what psychologists can use to perform their experiments. So we're going to start with the big and then move small. So I'm going to give you some techniques that are going to be true across all the social sciences, also in other sciences as well, and then we're going to get to psychology. And it all starts with my good buddy, Mill. Uh, Mill is a philosopher, and he argued that there are several rules of induction. Now, what is induction? To be what? To be allowed in. To be allowed in? Oh, that's uh, that's a different induction. That's a, uh, this is that's a different induction. Hall of Fame induction. That is a different. <laughs> that is the same induction <laughs> as hers, but different from mine. So then, no idea. <laughs> induction. You have all used induction. You've all used this procedure. I'm just going to teach you how to use it better. Induction is when you generalize from the particular. If you've ever said in anger, oh, all men are jerks, what you've done is you've started with man A, man B, man C, and then you went, oh, all of these men are jerks. I'm going to conclude all men are jerks. Or if you've ever said, all women are... Oh, what are all women? You got Good cooks. Good cooks. Good cook. All women are good... Why do we... Okay, whatever. <laughs> all women are good cooks. I don't believe All right. I would have... I would know one female who was good, a second female who was good, a third, and then I would induce or I would generalize from the specific experiences that I've had to the general truth that all women are good cooks and men are jerks for not realizing it. Right? That's the conclusion. Now, notice that the issue here is not am I correct or incorrect. It's the process that I'm using to do this. And in particular, what we're going to do with Mill is we're going to look for naturally occurring agreements. At first, we're going to look for naturally occurring agreements, disagreements, and a nice fancy phrase, concamenate variations. So the first step for many of the sciences is to look for, and the key word for here is naturally occurring. The second process we're going to use is to take, not make them naturally, but artificially or experimentally occurring. So what I want to do is I want to introduce you to the concepts of agreement, disagreement, and concamenant variations. They're fancy terms for stuff that you've probably all used before. So let's see how uh, this might work. We're going to look at agreement and difference and concamenate variations. We're going to know how do these uh, work in practice. So that's where we're headed for the first bit of today. All right, the method of agreement. We can state it fancily this way. The method of agreement means that if one factor is the only thing in common when effect is produced, that factor is a potential cause. <coughs> so, what I'm going to look for here is, let's say that I am really trying to figure out my good buddy, uh, Andrew, right? And I notice that when Andrew is with Bob and Casey, that Andrew is irritable. Well, it could be that Bob and Casey make Andrew irritable. It could be he's having a bad day. It could be he's hungry, it could be he's tired, I don't know. But if I'm curious to find out about Andrew, what I can do is make him the only thing in common. So if I notice that when Andrew is also with David and Francis, he's also irritable, he's the only thing in common. And then I notice that when Andrew is with George and Howard, Andrew is also irritable. And so if Andrew is the only thing in common across all of these situations, what might I conclude? He's irritable. That he's always irritable. So I might, I, I might suspect, so the key here is suspect, because I haven't done anything fancy 
to prove that Andrew is an irritable person, but I certainly have grounds to think that he might be, right? If you ask me about Andrew and I'm thinking over my experiences with him, I'm like, well, it was Bob and Casey, he was irritable, Dave and Francis, irritable, uh, Jordan Howard, he's irritable. You know, he just seems to be an irritable person. So this is the method of agreement. You look for the one thing in common across all situations. What do you imagine the method of difference is going to be? Yeah, you look for you look for the factor that's not in common. So we're going to uh, so the method of agreement is you look for the one thing that is. The method of difference is if you believe that a factor is a cause, you you look to see what happens when you remove that factor. If you remove it and still get an effect, all right, that's not it. But if you remove it and the effect disappears, all right. Maybe you're on to something. So I'll give an example. Uh, for many years, I loved to go to Chili's. Not as much as Arby's, but if Chili's were to give me coupons, I would certainly go to them too. I loved Chili's, but I had a problem with Chili's. Namely, that I would go and I would order uh, the queso. Love their queso dip. I mean, how can you go to Chili's and not get their queso? I would then get their Philly cheesesteak. And I would have a drink, and for the purpose of this course, let's say it was a uh, Diet Coke. Uh, but I would go, oh my gosh. And what basically what happened in my world was I'd go to Chili's, I, I then would get nauseated, and I would wait about six months, and I'd go, why have I been to Chili's? And I would go to Chili's, get nauseated, <laughs> and repeat. And I'm like, oh man, the Philly cheesesteak is making me nauseated. How might I test that idea? To Chili's and get the queso and put that coat. Right, that's what I would do. I would go to uh, Chili's, get the queso, my drink. Oh, my stomach doesn't hurt. Have I proven that the Philly cheesesteak is making me sick? No. No. Right? Because what else? What else might it be? Yeah, you're right. It absolutely could be the combination. I actually suspect that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> because if you if y'all have ever had the queso in their Philly cheese, that is a lot of grease to pour on a stomach. It's like uh, right. So I I suspect that it's the Philly cheese steak, but I have not proven that it's the Philly cheese steak. But this is how I can start doing this kind of analysis. So let's say I think it's the queso. I would then have no queso. I don't know how I would go to Chili's and I get their queso though. That's like. <laughs> Yeah, why would I go there? <laughs> no, it's like... Um, so, this would be the method of difference. I, I remove a factor and see what happens at this point. So, this, I'm looking for naturally occurring situations. And in this case, I might think to myself, huh, the last time I went, I didn't get the Philly cheesesteak because uh, it wasn't on the menu, and I don't feel that bad. So, uh, maybe the Philly cheesesteak. The third one, contaminant variation. This is simply says that if something is a causal factor, or we might think to ourselves a putative causal factor, if changing it changes the outcome. You have all used contaminant variations. If you've ever had a certain kind of car that made a noise when you drove it. Like I drove a car all through graduate school that made noises. When you'd go to stop, it sounded like it was having sex with you, because it would go, eh, uh, eh, uh, all right? When it would go a little too fast, you know, doors flew off. I don't know. It was not a very good car, is all I'm trying to say. And I would wonder whether or not the speed influenced the noise I would hear. Well, how would I test the idea that the speed is causing the noise to get louder? Well, when I hit the accelerator, if the noise goes up, all right, that's helping me out. And when I slow down, if the noise goes down, the noise gets, sorry, yeah, the noise goes quieter, I start thinking, oh, it's related to speed, right? And that's ultimately what I concluded about that car is the noises it made depended on the speed. So this would be a way of testing it. Uh, all right, so this would be contaminant variation. This method is very, very useful if I can't eliminate a variable. Now, what are some situations where I can't eliminate a variable? Well, let's say I'm trying to figure out if the moon causes tides. 
I can't very well use the method of agreement or the method of difference because I can't get rid of the moon. I can't add a moon. What I can do is I can see whether or not it ver the tides vary over the course of the position of the moon. So the first thing I can do is I can use naturally occurring uh, agreements, disagreements, and concatenate variations. This is used across all of the social sciences. And you very often see it with population distributions. You very often will have a social scientist go, all right, there's something, there's a, there's a, a, a feature which varies across populations. And I'll give you one. This is actually a really cool one because we're not in an election season right now, and so maybe we can talk about this as reasonable adults. There are some electoral systems that are called single member district plurality systems. That's our system. Our, our system is a single member district plurality. What that means is we're going to elect a, someone to the House of Representatives, right? All right, so people run. We're going to select one winner, single, right? Single member from our district, and that person is going to be selected whoever gets the plurality of votes, right? So if we all run for election, person who gets the majority of the votes is going to go to Congress. So we're, we have a single member, one, one person, dip from our district, wins by plurality and goes. Other countries use what is called a proportional representation system. And in this system, the people who get elected to their body of government isn't whoever gets the plurality, it's proportional. So if we go around the room and we find that 30% of the room are Christian, 30% of the room are Muslim, and 30% of the room are Hindu, and 10% are other, then the way you would determine this system is the proportion of votes that everyone gets is going to determine the representation in the government. So this government would be composed of 30% Christian, 30% Muslim, 30% Hindu, and 10%, I forget what they are, others. Well, let's see how this might play out in practice. This is sort of intriguing because one of the criticisms that people often make of our government system is we only have two major parties. And people go, well, why not the Green Party or why not the Libertarian Party? As it turns out, what you can do is you can actually see what happens across political systems. And what you find is if you, if you make a chart, and so we have our single member district plurality and proportional representation, and we look at the number of political parties, we tend to find that a single member district plurality one encourages fewer parties compared to a proportional representation system. So we would say in the aggregate, there's a concatenate variation between these types of systems. So what this might suggest is if you're unhappy with there's only two major parties, the solution may not be anything to do with campaign finance. What if we move to a different kind of system? Hmm. Intriguing. Anyone grew up in a proportional uh, system? If you were guessing, which one do you think is probably the most common across the globe? I'll let y'all vote. Let y'all vote. Which one of these do you think is most common across the globe? Do you think it's? Do you think this is the most common system across the globe? Single member district plurality or proportional representation? A is this, and this is B. What do you think is most common? Let's go five, four, three, two, one. See where we are at on this one. Um, yeah, I don't know if y'all just know how my already work. Yeah, the proportional representation is actually the most common. So, what I'm going to come back to this later, which is why I introduce it now, because I'm going to ask questions about if this biases people. Oh, what? Oh, <laughs> nothing I can do about that. <laughs>